Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Tony Sparrow. Welcome to another edition of Seekers of the Supernatural with your hosts, Ed Warren and Lorraine Warren. Tonight, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to go into a very fascinating case to start. The case of Florence Viner, who lived in a haunted house and had some terrible incidences happen. Questions have been asked of, of us, of Ed and Lorraine. What do you do when you see a ghost? What do you do if you see a ghost? Those questions and many others will be answered for you tonight. I'd like to start with Mr. Warren, if I could. Ed, I know you're going to talk about the Viner case, but can you tell us what would someone do if they encountered a ghost? Well, Tony, it would all depend on the uh, circumstances, the situation, the whole thing. If you're in a car like Rod Veshi was driving along at 1.30 in the morning and a ghost suddenly appears alongside you in the car, what can you do? Hmm. You know, and it comes so fast, and then the, the uh, apparition disappears quickly. So by the time that you're trying to figure out what you should do, it's already gone, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, some people, of course, would just be very startled. But if you're, say, a Christian, you're lying in bed, and uh, something wakes you up, and you look out into the darkness, and you see a ghostly figure there, a woman, a man, whatever it might be, uh, you simply make the sign of the cross in the direction that you're looking at it, and you would say, in the name of God, is there something that I can help you with? Uh, you shouldn't really hold a lot of communication with spirits. But in some cases, you're dealing with earthbound spirits, people who are very confused when they died. They don't understand why they're not in that physical body anymore. And they're drawn mm -hmm. to the aura of a very sensitive person. And during the sleeping state, as you wake up, you are in a good situation where a spirit can reach you. Mm -hmm. because you're on that same astral level. <coughs> so I would suggest that you simply say, in the name of God, is there something that I can do to help you? If it's an evil spirit, it will disappear immediately. If it's a positive one, say it's a, a relative or some spirit that's just been drawn to you, then you might get some com communication. I know there's been people that uh, have seen spirits of children, of uh, adults, and they get very frightened, mm -hmm. and they'll jump up and run out of the room. Well, that's natural reaction for most people. But actually, what you should do is to find out what it is, what they want. It's kind of like uh, this woman over in Torrington. It was her own husband that would show up. Mm -hmm. And uh, she woke up one night soon after he died, about six months later, which I think was beautiful, but it scared her. And he would be sitting right in the chair, just like you're sitting there. and he would say, are you all right, dear? And she got so frightened, she jumped out of bed and <laughs> ran out of the house and wouldn't come back wow. for a few days. And then the same thing happened when she went back in again. She jumped out of bed and ran right you know, out of the house again. So the third time, her daughter said, Mom, why don't you just ask Dad what he wants or tell him that you are perfectly all right? Which she did, and she seen him get up. He was sitting in a chair. He got up, mm -hmm. walked down the hallway, and she never seen him again. But he he was disturbed by the fact that something was bothering the wife, which of course it would be. He was trying to put her mind at ease. Mm -hmm. um, say, for instance, you encounter a spirit in a haunted house, right? And it's uh, one that's a very negative spirit. In that case, you're not going to hang around and ask what it wants because you're going to be frightened out of your wits. So in them kind of cases, I simply say, get out of the house yourself, leave, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, there are spirits that can do great physical harm to people. In tonight's uh, presentation, we're going to be talking about a house in Woodstock, uh, Connecticut, which is almost on the Massachusetts border. Very interesting case. <coughs> Mrs. Florence Viner who was, uh, I think she was Miss Connecticut or Miss... She was. She Miss was Miss Connecticut, Connecticut. at one time. Mm -hmm. Very pretty looking lady. And she got married to an older man. They bought this old inn, mm -hmm. an old revolutionary inn it was, not realizing it, that it was very haunted. And soon after they moved in, they had the farmhands, some of them who would live upstairs in this home. And... Uh, the farmhands would go to the bed with knives under their pillows. One even had a gun, and they said, well, why do you have knives? Why do you have guns? And they said, well, we're frightened to stay up there, Mrs. Viner. She said, frightened of what? 
they told her that you know the doors would open and close, uh, the beds would shake. Uh, they were scared. They would hear somebody running up the stairs. Mm -hmm. uh, they would hear what sounded like a fight between two men going on. They would hear the clash of swords, and uh, this would really frighten them. So one night she was home alone, and her husband didn't come home yet. She was waiting for him to come home. And all of a sudden she heard something open the door, pounding on the door, open the door, footsteps ran up these stairs. Then she heard what sounded like a fight between two men and then two thumps. Well, she said that, you know, she was so frightened, she went in and she got her 22 revolver. Jeez. She went upstairs, but she couldn't find anything. Came down again, and then she told about other incidents occurring where uh, she would be lying in bed, and suddenly she would hear this loud, roaring sound. She said it sounded almost like a foundry, hmm. and uh, her husband wouldn't hear a thing. He would be almost like in a state of thantomania, paralyzation. He was, she couldn't even wake him up. Then she would see this here glow, uh, and it would form into a ball, electromagnetic ghost ball, and then it would go into a cigar shape, and she'd see this dark form moving all around the room, a shadow ghost. But I think it's important, um, Tony, to realize, or for our viewers to realize, like Ed just gave reference to her husband and how he was affected. Mm -hmm. That is very, very common. The majority of the cases that are brought to our attention, they will tell us the woman of the house. Remember that women are more sensitive, so women Lorraine, perceive things. Lorraine, I have to correct you. They're not patients, they're clients. If they're patients, they'd be in a mental institution. <laughs> what, what patients? You said patients, didn't you? No, I said viewers. No, you said it, some of our patients that call some us. Some of our patients? Oh, I did? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> she, she did, I, didn't hear, I didn't hear you say they're that. They're very oh, normal it, people. I, I, I didn't God, hear you say I that. I hope so. That might I have been a psychic. you got to be very quick, Tony. you got to be very quick. <laughs> might have been a psychic sound. You know, Maybe. I've interviewed people for, you know, thousands of times, so well, right, right away, I know well, what she well, meant. We'll play this tape back. We'll see. I know what she meant, but it wasn't what you said. Did you say patients, really? I don't think so, but I may have. We'll play it back. We'll play it back. You met clients, right? But, yes, and they'll call and say this. Now, the husband uh, is the last to, ex seems to experience anything. I would say 75% of our cases. Yeah, but even if they do experience something, they're the last guy to admit it because right. they moved everything into that house. Yeah. You know, they've got to move everything out of that house. And this is a farm. This is a, a working farm that they're on, you know. Although the man was an uh, electrical uh, engineer and he decided to change his life, and going to farming and like that with his new bride, you know. Uh, at that time, he was already in his late 50s. And I guess she was up in her 40s, right? She was, yes. And uh, so he didn't want to start moving out of the house. But, you know, when things started to happen to him and her a lot, you know, then they decided that something had to be done. That's how. That's when we were called and that's in. when they sold the, uh, the place. But mm -hmm. No, they called us in before they sold it. They called us in right about the time they were in transition. Because they said... You that said it again. You said patience again. I'm only kidding. <laughs> I'm only oh, kidding. tease me. <laughs> We're only teasing. You got to be straightened out, Hillary. But uh, they called us in just about that period of time, Tony. And um, they said no matter what our findings were, they were going to find it totally impossible to stay in this house. Mm -hmm. But our findings were very interesting. Very, very interesting. Very interesting from the standpoint of, of how I was affected when I went into this house. And I think it's interesting for people to realize, see, as a researcher, Ed and I go in, and you go in. I mean, we, we go in to research, but I, uh, of the three of us, I'm the only one that discerns. But discernment is different in different homes. And in this particular case, uh, I went up onto the second floor because what you do is to walk throughout the house to see exactly what you feel. Mm. Yeah. And I walked into this one bedroom, and I stood in that bedroom, Tony, and I looked out onto the real open fields, no trees, just all open fields. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't see it as it is right now. I could see fires, I could see people in small groups, some, with, do, some type of worship that they were involved in. I could see all like little stone type of, not really that little of fireplaces, but hmm. 
the stones that were used by these pagan people, because that is what we found out that they were, were now in the foundation of this building. And mm, okay. so the building got off to a bad start to start with. But then we know that tragedy creates the ghost syndrome. And this home owned that Florence Viner and her husband owned had once been Lions Inn. And it was on the old stagecoach road between Hartford and Boston. During the Revolutionary War. During mm -hmm. the Revolutionary War. And there had been some very fascinating experiences that had taken place here. But why they take place is so important. We know that tragedy creates it, but what were the tragedies? Now, in checking back, we found that a, a farm, or a, yeah, he was a farmhand that worked there, and he had a girlfriend, mm -hmm. and the girlfriend worked at the bar, kind of like a barmaid, but I don't think you would have called her a barmaid in days like that. I don't no. know what they would have called her. Barmaid. And um, this, this man came that uh, on horseback that was going to be staying there, and he had an affair with this guy's um, girlfriend. And as a result of it, they, he, he killed him. And that is the, the battle that Florence Viner would hear replayed over and over where someone would come in the door, go running up the stairs, hear the fight between, or the scuffle between two men, and then the thumps on the floor. But we also have in this house uh, uh, something most unusual, and that is where teleportation takes place. And, and the first case of that took place during the Revolutionary War where an officer came up and he had uh, his, uh, what do they call him? Page. Page with him. And he sent the boy into the barn, mm -hmm. and he waited for the boy to come out, waited for him to come out, and never came out. To this day, nobody knows what happened to the boy. <coughs> but the interesting thing is that uh, a family by the name of Dupre's uh, lived in that house uh, many years before Florence Viner. And they had a 13-year-old da daughter, and she had four other children. Mm -hmm. And now I'm going back, of course, way back to 19, maybe 30, 31, 32. And the kids uh, went to a small schoolhouse about two miles from the house. In them days, there was no school buses, so they had to take them horse and wagon. And that's what they did. They had a horse and wagon, and Laura Klimp complained that uh, she, had mumps. she had mumps, that she was sick. You know, she didn't want to go to school that day. So the mother said, all right, stay home, she said, and uh, I'll take the other children. But when she came back, Laura was gone, and to this day, nobody knows what happened to her. But Lorraine clairvoyantly picked up what did happen to that girl in a closet that she hid from this same dark shadow ghost that appeared in uh, Florence Viner's bedroom. You know, well, really, to kind of prove out that, y you know, what you picked up was really accurate, let me explain what happened, Tony. This is one of the downstairs living rooms mm -hmm. in this old home. And again, I stood and I walked over by the window, and when I did, I put my hands up on either side of my neck because <coughs> it hurt. And what I was doing is picking up through what we call radio telethesis, the pain, the pain. and the, the ills of that young girl. And I looked down at myself, and you know, I wasn't seeing myself as I am, I was seeing myself as, as this girl. And I was wearing like a nightgown that was like unbleached type of coloring mm -hmm. and heavy and long sleeves. Mm -hmm. And I stood there and as I looked, I could see the road right directly outside of the window, but the road isn't there today. But it was during that period wow. of time. The road has been changed. And I turned around and I walked over to stand by the fire to keep to keep warm because my face was hurting me and I could see the mantle I could feel the heat of the fire Tony mm -hmm. but the mantle 
had been removed and the fireplace had been bricked up. And that mantle wow. is in one of the buildings at Sturbridge Village. Really? Wow. Yeah. We're going to be showing some slides now of the uh, house and Mrs. Viner and, and different locations mm -hmm. up but there. Before, or why that slide, why the slides are coming up, um, Tony, um, this very big, huge, dark form. I think you just wait until he gets it up there because I hear the clicking. I hear it moving, advancing. It's advancing as you speak. Um, okay, so the fly slides are going to be of the inside of the house? No, it's uh, of the outside. I think of he the wants house. you to reverse them. Ed, uh, you went too far back. Go, go backwards with it. Go back on. Okay, we're going to see the first slide, I guess, out of the, Bowman, of the uh, Viner property. Mm -hmm. Yep, there's the house as we went into it. And of course, as we said, that was. A revolutionary inn at the time. Mm -hmm. Now, and Tony, see where the red car or the uh, yeah the truck the truck is back there. Mm -hmm. All right, that's how the road <laughs> used to go, mm -hmm. and that's where I could look out and see them getting in that horse and carriage. Okay, now well, this is now, another shot of the house. Yeah, right the in. house began to deteriorate that's Mrs. a great Forrest deal. That's Mrs. out in front of the house. Okay, and again, keep in mind that. The house looked much better when she lived there. This is about 12 years later, later. after she left. Yeah. Mm -hmm. She brought us back to the house okay. because they really kept it up beautifully. Oh, yeah. She done there the whole she is place again, all over. By the fireplace Beautiful. where many things home. would happen. She said one night she was by that fireplace and uh, all of a sudden she heard like an explosion like sound. Mm -hmm. And she ran into the bedroom where the baby was. Oh, yeah. And uh, the door had uh, almost came off of the hinges. Mm -hmm. Now you'll see this particular area again now. Oh yeah. This is one of the farmhands, farm hands. and he's talking about the fact that he's afraid to stay upstairs at night, especially when none of the other people are around. He's the guy that would carry knives and guns and every other thing. In Under there. their pillows, they. But kept you can them. see it wasn't exactly a cozy place there. No. And now she's showing me the hallway where she heard the explosion-like sound, which comes through a phenomena that's uh, called telekinesis. Telekinesis can actually explode objects such as tables or lamps or doors. In this case, it was the door. And here she's showing us a hasp block that was on her that actually blew open. And you can see a radiator just to the left there. Mm -hmm. And that radiator was still vibrating when uh, Mrs. Viner went in there. Wow. Now, they said that they would hear uh, somebody pounding on the door three times they would hear somebody running up the stairs, then there would be a fight, and then they would hear two thumps. The two thumps were the two bodies of these men. The haunting was being recreated over and over mm -hmm. again. Uh, they had swords in those days, and this is what they used. And mm -hmm. they also found blood on one of the walls, which they couldn't get rid of. She had put wallpaper over that she sent from England with, and uh, it came right through the wallpaper and everything. Now you'll see a few more slides here that uh, we've gotten. There's the uh, hallway. You notice how the hallways, Tony, where it can build up, uh, where the vibrations build up so much more? In a small area. Because a small, small area, yes. That's the mother-in-law. She, she was Mrs. Uh, Viner's mother, his mother-in-law. And she stayed there one night. She said, Florence, what's wrong? You're newly married with this man. And I hear you arguing and fighting all during the night. She says, Mom, I'm not arguing and fighting, and I suppose I have to tell you that this house was haunted. She said her mother wasted no time. She was out of there that night, and that was the end of it. Wow. I still have a couple more uh, slides here I'll show you. Now, she's painting this room, and as I said, she had gotten wallpaper from England. You know, she had put it up there. This was 12 years later, so it didn't look like that when she was there. Mm -hmm. And it was a hot September day, and suddenly, as she was painting the wall, she felt something in the room with her. Uh, it became icy cold, she said. And then there was this foul stench, and she felt something on her shoulder. She said she dropped the paint, it went all over the floor, she got so scared, and she ran out of the house, and she waited for her daughter, who was coming home on a school boy, bus. Boy, oh boy. Mm. So then there was the case, of course, of Laura Dupre, which is in the files of the state police in that area going back to the early 1930s. She has never been found. So we have a case of teleportation apparently occurring here. But you know, there's been many such cases of teleportation that we've talked about on here. I'm thinking about a Dr. Vidal who not only 
disappeared with his wife in a car. Uh, these two people are driving along. They lived in Argentina. They were going to uh, a relative's birthday party, which was some 60 miles away. And uh, after the party, they had neighbors with them who were going to follow them. So they're heading back to their home, which is mm -hmm. 60 miles away. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden, the neighbors said that a green fog enveloped the Vidal's car. Now, this was in 1953. And uh, then all of a sudden, this green mist lifted. No car was there. Nothing else was there. Mm -hmm. But the Vidal's found themselves in Hawaii. And they opened up, you know, uh, the door of their car. It's broad daylight. It was night when they were out there. There's no paint on the car. It's as though somebody had sanded the whole car. Oh, boy. Uh, they were, of course, naturally puzzled by what had happened. Yeah. They were teleported from Argentina Jeez. to Hawaii. Isn't that wild? And um, mm. UCLA took the car, and they gave them another car for it. And to this day, it's a puzzle as to what that happened. That is wild. But yeah. they died very close together, Tony. They, yes, the woman died soon after that. And the husband hmm. didn't. Dr. Vidal didn't live that long. Do we have long. any more slides you want to watch, or is, or is that no? Is that uh, it? Uh, that's it. Of Vi of yes, Viner's. Of the, okay, of that's the all the slides. Of the Vi Viner case. But it's talking about you know teleportation. You do have a couple of slides of you, in there. Yes. Yeah. Talking with the family. Can I use them? Yes. Right, he just took it. He just took the camera. That's off right. The slides. Don't worry about it. But um, you know there are many ways that things can teleport. That's okay, Henry. Uh, Henry, that's all right. Okay. There, there are many ways that things uh, teleport. It's not only people, Tony. Objects, you know, have also we've. Um, and they can appear too. They can appear. Appear. And these are called apports. Apports. Yeah. In fact, can you, just, they, can you tell the audience Ed, because you use a lot of terms tonight? Can you just? I'll go through the terms: radio telethesis, mm -hmm. teleportation, mm -hmm. telekinesis, psychokinesis, psychokinesis, or mm -hmm. psychokinesis. And what the last one you just used? Apport. Apport. So can you go through like radio telethesis? Tell okay, us radio telethesis would be a feeling that the medium like Lorraine gets of being ill, um, maybe being wounded. If it was a soldier dying, she would get that same feeling. Mm -hmm. She's feeling the ills or the sickness or the death <coughs> of that spirit. Or the yeah. anguish. It's coming through her. Okay, and teleportation? Teleportation is when something is teleported from one location to another location. For instance, these cups here. This cup could be right there. All of a sudden, it would be gone. It could be found 100 miles away from here. But they dematerialize at one place, Tony, and they reappear at another. So that would be the airport. The airport would be right. the reappearance. Yes. The molecular structure of that item is broken down, and it goes into another dimension and somehow reaches this other point. Where they have airport seances, these are special mediumistic people who can bring all types of things into that seance room. Jewelry, money, flowers, almost anything. Even animals and birds. They, they make them appear in that room, you mean? They are mm -hmm. actually airport. Uh, Franek Glusky was uh, an airport medium. He was very famous in Poland. And from 1939 until 1942, this man could actually bring about uh, huge birds and in one case it was a gorilla like uh, image and it was, it was physical it was very physical it was real looking. Mm -hmm. it looked real like Bigfoot yeah now, and I heard you use another term one time and you use the word and we'll just see if you can explain this also to the audience the word tulpa what is that tulpa all right tulpa is a physical manifestation of the mind high raspas in Tibet who are monks can bring about these types of phenomena mm-hmm in other words, a high raspa could actually create a thought image called a tulpa. And if it wanted to create, say, a cat over there, it would simply think about it through thought and create a physical manifestation of that cat. Mm -hmm. So that's what a tulpa would be. You know, how about um, telekinesis and, and psycho, okay. psychokinesis? Telekinesis is a a wording that Dr. Ryan used, who was called the father of parapsychology way back in the 1930s. When he walked into a house one day, and it was a poltergeist phenomena, and uh, suddenly this table exploded with a phone on it. It just exploded. And uh, that was the first time he used it, the explosion of an object through telekinesis. 
telepathic sound. But if you look into your dictionary, an occult dictionary, you'll see telekinesis is being used in the movement of objects, but it is not. Psychokinesis and psychokinesis mm -hmm. is the movement of objects. So someplace along the line here, they got a little fouled up. But that's where telekinesis comes in. Uh, telekinesis uh, is also the way that uh, sound can be projected to people in a room. For instance, uh, we hear footsteps. There's nobody there, but the ghost is simply thinking of what footsteps sound like, mm -hmm. and you hear that. A door slams. There is no door that slams, but so that's you like, hear that. Is that like telepathic sound then? Telepathic mm -hmm. sound, that's right. So that's how ghosts make those noises yep. to us? They that's why, it? Tony, when we have recorders in a house, and we've got those recorders on, and we're hearing all kinds of sounds in that house, but we don't get it on our recorder later. Right, then, right. Right. Other times, though, we don't hear the sounds, and the recorder picks it up. Mm-hmm. The tape picks it up, on, and we will hear voices, spirit voices, knockings, bangings, whatever it might be. So that, that, <coughs> that gentleman that you speak of, that Ted Sirios, what he does when he holds the, the camera up to his forehead or his, through his eyes, and he implants an image onto the film, that's psychokinesis, right? That is a thought form. He's mm -hmm. thinking of uh, the Empire State Building, mm -hmm. and uh, all of a sudden he looks into the uh, Polaroid camera, the lens, snaps the shutter, and sometimes the image of the Empire State Building will Comes appear. Out. That's, that's and wonderful. that's the way the ghost does it, too. That's, that's wild. That's, uh, that's very similar, Tony, to how a psychic photograph is taken. Also, realize that. Which we'll Where the ghost of. can do that. Okay, we're just about out of time, so I'd like to tell the audience how they can contact us, and we mm -hmm. appreciate your letters, by the way. We really appreciate them. And you could send your inquiries to the Warrens, Post Office Box 41 in Monroe, right here in Monroe, 06468 at any time you want. And if you want to be a guest on the show, you can even ask for that. And if you have a case you want to share with us, you know, be more than happy to listen to it and to take your letters and cards. So for Ed Warren, for Lorraine Warren, I'm Tony Sparrow. Good night. Good night.